Uh, CSIS, um, thank you for joining us uh, for today's event on the Brazilian election and Brazil's foreign policy under the next administration. Uh, this event is part of a uh, CSIS America's Brazil initiative. Uh, the initiative engages a series of issue areas in which bilateral cooperation and private sector collaboration can improve understanding about Brazil. Uh, so as you know, uh, today's event has a dual purpose. Uh, on the one hand, uh, this wonderful group that we have here on stage will be uh, talking about Brazil's presidential election and uh, what uh, it'll mean for the country's foreign policy. Uh, on the other hand, I'm thrilled to launch our latest report, uh, co-authored with my good friend and colleague Hussein Kalut from Harvard's uh, Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. Uh, the uh, paper is entitled Brazil's Presidential Elections, Expectations for Foreign Policy. Uh, the report is available on our website, csis.org forward slash Americas. Uh, and it's a really informative uh, piece. Uh, it was really great to uh, partner up with Hussein, so I recommend it to all of you. Uh, I think you should check it out. Um, anyway, this is a very exciting time for Brazil. Uh, the first round elections take place this Sunday, and arguably they're the most contested in recent uh, memory. Uh, Dilma Rousseff, the current president, has recently pulled ahead in polls relative to her chief rivals, Marina Silva and Aécio Neves. Uh, I'm sure many of you know uh, Marina's candidacy has itself been something of an upset. Initially, the vice presidential running mate for Eduardo Campos, Marina, took over the top of the ticket when Eduardo Campos tragically died in a plane uh, crash late summer. And she represents a, a, a change, I'd say, in tone for many Brazilians, uh, a reality which caused an early surge of support uh, for her candidacy. Uh, but according to many, this election is up for grabs. Even with Dilma's current lead, it's unlikely that we will see her win in the first round. And the second round is a completely different game. Uh, and a huge part of what makes all of this so interesting are the implications for Brazil's foreign policy, which is the main issue. Of, uh, of our event today. Uh, relative to her predecessors, Dilma has arguably mm -hmm. dialed back the government's focus on foreign policy. So some feel that the prospect of change in, in the administration or the prospect of a change in the election could mean change from Brazil's approach to foreign policy. So what can we really expect then? Uh, I personally think, uh, as is highlighted in our paper, uh, that any change will be uh, in narrative but not in content of Brazil's foreign policy. Brazil's foreign policy is based on a set of firmly held tenets uh, that aren't likely to change quickly. It's much more likely, though, that each candidate, if elected, would rebalance the country's foreign policy priorities based on their own interests. Perhaps, for example, a Marina presidency could see renewed cooperation with the U.S. on the basis of shared environmental concerns because of her background. Uh, or with Mr. Neves, expanded commercial relations. Uh, or with Dilma, a deepening of her focus on Brazil's existing multilateral commitments. Uh, but what about Brazil's relationship with the United States? As I was walking in, uh, a good friend of mine uh, at the embassy mentioned to me, uh, U.S. and Brazil reached an agreement yesterday on the WTO cotton dispute. So, you know, there are some positive things that are happening in this relationship, but I think more is to be seen uh, after the election. The U.S. and Brazil are natural partners, despite the recent tensions that belie that reality. The two countries share a tendency toward pres prescriptive foreign policy, an unease with dispassionate geopolitical dealings, and a commitment to the most fundamental democratic values. In this regard, I think we're on a set course for our paths to converge. There are a lot of areas of potential shared interest for the U.S. and Brazil, energy, competitiveness, innovation, technology. Ultimately, what matters is that the two countries look to where their interests overlap as a guide for working together. Uh, and through that kind of mutual understanding, the U.S. and Brazil can build trust, make bilateral uh, relations uh, and progress real without letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, but for now, I'll leave it there. Uh, we're going to dive into the answers to all of these questions during this afternoon's event, and uh, I'd like to get started. So I'm going to quickly introduce 
our panelists, um, and then uh, Hussein's going to give a little bit uh, of the content of our report, uh, and then we're going to move on to some a, a good conversation here with the folks that we have. So first, uh, I want to introduce Paulo Sotero, who is the director of the Brazil Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Center. He's an award-winning journalist, a native of Sao Paulo, and lecturer at some of Washington's most esteemed universities. And I would say he's probably the senior Brazilianist that we have here in Washington. So, and one of the oldest. Also. And the oldest. <laughs> uh, 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 we have Claudia Trevisian, uh, who is the Washington correspondent of O Estado de Sao Paulo. She's worked in journalism for the past 25 years all around the world. She's an accomplished author, and she's a senior associate of the Americas program here at CSIS. And uh, I'm really happy that she's my friend. And uh, Sergio Lamucci, who's a new friend, and uh, Washington correspondent for Valor Economico, where he's been since 2003. Like Paolo, uh, he's an award-winning journalist and a specialist on Brazil's foreign policy, especially toward the United States. Welcome. And last but not least, my good friend, Hussein Kalouk, the co-author of this report. Uh, and he's a political scientist, professor of international relations, uh, Brazilian foreign policy expert, and research scholar at Harvard's Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. Welcome. I think this is the beginning of a very close partnership. It's been a true pleasure to work with you on this report. Uh, I've learned a lot, and I hope uh, our, our partnership endures. Uh, so thanks to all of you for joining here, uh, us here at CSIS. I'm sure it's going to be a great discussion. Uh, just a few reminders. We're on the record today. We're webcasting live, so greetings to the folks that are watching us. Uh, after the discussion, uh, we will engage uh, in a Q&A session. Uh, we want to try to get as many people to participate. Uh, so we are going to um, uh, hopefully benefit from your knowledge as well and have a very vibrant conversation about such an interesting issue. So, Without further ado, Hussein, uh, I'll allow for you to start, and then we'll get to our panelists. Thank you, Carl. Uh, I would like to express the honor and the privilege to be here at the CSIS. And uh, I would like to thank you for this remarkable experience uh, to work in partnership with you and with your staff. And also, I'm very glad to be here between friends, some familiar faces. Uh, from the Brazilian Embassy and also from other places in the bureaucracy of Washington. Well, uh, we worked hard in this piece of paper trying to understand and trying to imagine how could be the foreign policy of especially of ASU and especially of Marina, because already we knew it, uh, we tested the foreign policy of Dilma in the last uh, four years. Uh, basically, uh, our conclusion or brief conclusion it is uh, no matter whom gonna win the elections Brazil is a very solid country and has very solid principles in foreign policy and I think it is uh, we can see a great consensus between the three main candidates uh, in the broader lines of the Brazilian uh, principles let me say that such as the um, uh, enhancement of the multilateral institutions, the reform of the Security Council of the United Nations and the Brazilian aspiration for a permanent seat, uh, the respect of the international law, the protection of the human rights and uh, enhancement of the democracy and uh, uh, the enhancement also of the sustainable development. So basically those are the main lines and uh, uh, none of the three candidates will be able to change uh, essentially uh, those principles. Basically what I can say it is uh, the Labour Party, the PT as we call in Brazil, again want to introduce a foreign policy labeled by Brazil leader of the South, the Global South, Brazil's leader of the countries in development, Brazil want to rebalance the geoeconomical order and want to be a very important and influential actor in the international political scene. Aesios, on the other hand, his foreign policy label is based on Brazil should emphasize uh, its diplomacy as a trader state, 
Uh, he wants to be more closer to the orbit of the Western powers. Uh, he wants to restart or renew the relation with the United States, with the European Union, and probably he could have a little harder politics towards South America or toward Argentina particularly. Well, Marina Silva, it's, uh, I guess she's kind of between of the, the boat foreign policy. So she has some aspects from the PT and she has other aspects from, from uh, the PSDB, the Social Democrat Party. Uh, but I think what Marina aspires, uh, it is uh, to be recognized as the humanitarian environmentalist uh, leader and probably she wanna push a agenda based on that project, projecting Brazil as the leader of uh, this uh, subject. Um, well, in Marina platform or a foreign policy paper, uh, she emphasized that Brazil should take more uh, steps or strong actions related to humanitarian field, human rights. But there is a very gray area. Diplomacy is not the white and black, you know, and that probably will result in some costs for Brazil. So uh, there's some incongruencies in her analysis, in her paper, for example, to condemn Russia and what related to Crimea and the other day to take some coffee with the Russian and the BRICS. That's not something factable, you know, especially at least for the Russian perspective. Um, well, what I also can um, a point here that we can see certain disengagement from some areas. Uh, likewise, the Middle East. I think ISU foreign policy will be will still link it economically because Brazil in the last ten years increased its trade to the Middle East from three billion dollars to twenty five billions of dollars. So I think ISU will keep it, but he will withdraw a little bit in some political aspects. Um, I think for the Labour Party, Brazil will keep the same strategy with no, without any innovation. And uh, Marina is a great incognito in this subject because she doesn't have any mention uh, to her foreign policy towards the Middle East except Syria and uh, the civil war at Syria and Brazil uh, will be a little bit critical about what's going on there. But definitely what I can say, she, she is uh, quite susceptible to some pressures, especially from the evangelical side, which they are quite closely uh, with the Jewish lobby. So yes, indeed, what um, possibly she can do in like in Gaza war, it's uh, different actions rather than Dilma governments. Like, uh, I do not believe that you will withdraw an ambassador or condemn one side without the other. Uh, possibly she could be more, pushed more uh, toward uh, more balanced, well, not balanced, could be at least pro-Israeli policy. Uh, but the main challenge of all the candidates, it's how to combine moralistic and idealistic aspect with pragmatism and realism in the next uh, four years. So, and how they want, how they are going to make from their promises as a coherent guidelines of the Brazilian foreign policy. Great, great. So thank you, Hussein. Uh, with this, we're gonna open it up to our panelists. And Paolo, I'm sure you have many views and opinions on these issues. You've seen uh, administrations come and go. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, People make promises, sometimes they keep them, sometimes they don't. So it would be very interesting to hear your views and opinions on these issues. Well, um, first, uh, the idea that there is not going to be much change, followed by your description. I think, uh, uh, I believe that with, if President uh, <clears throat> Dilma Rousseff wins re-election, which is likely, maybe even probable at this point, uh, there won't be much change. Uh, she may have make an effort, she may make an effort to 
uh, get better relations with countries that are more meaningful for the Brazilian economy. The Brazilian economy will be the main driver of foreign policy, domestic policy, or any other policy in Brazil. Brazil is basically in a recession right now. It's not common in Brazil for Brazil to be in a recession. Brazilian foreign policy has, as one of its tenets, has always had is development, and development depends on economic growth. And Brazil does not have it now, and probably will not have much of it in the next couple of years. It makes very difficult to do foreign policy in that context. It conditions foreign policy. Uh, in the case, right now it's unlikely that either Marina or Aécio Neves will prevail. I think that there would be a significant change. Uh, first of all, uh, it's not, uh, uh, you know, the, there will be a, a going away from uh, the Bolivarian aspects of politics in South America. I think there will be an effort to try to recast Mercosur to its original purpose, was to, which was to promote trade integration and trade liberalization. Uh, right now, Mercosur is an obstacle to that. Uh, there would be, I believe, an effort to uh, really a better, a more engaging relationship with the United States along the lines President uh, Fernando Henrique Cardoso was engaged in with uh, Bill Clinton and even with w, uh, George W. Bush at the beginning. Uh, for one particular reason, unlike the party in power, uh, Aécio Neves uh, comes from an area of Brazilian politicians that do not have a chip on the shoulder regarding the United States. They don't have a predisposition against the United States. Uh, the traditional left in Brazil has. Uh, Marina Silva is a person that comes from the traditional left, but she brings a new element to the left, to the democratic left in Brazil, which is the idea of sustainability after she lost her first, uh, the, the first time she w ran for president in 2010. Actually, she came to the United States. She spent time here. She was uh, a, a fellow at MIT. Uh, she is uh, very well versed on topics like energy, et cetera, that are central to uh, a uh, effort to uh, try to put Brazil back on a growth pattern, but uh, an economy with higher quality. Uh, so I think that's a fundamental difference. It's not a small difference, uh, etc. cetera. The, uh, the other things uh, are, you know, there is nowadays in Brazil a enormous first of those that follow foreign policy. Foreign policy has been barely mentioned in the presidential election. Uh, President Dilma came to the United States to give a speech, but it was basically to use the platform to create some, you know, try to get some dividends at home. Uh, didn't work very well. Uh, she was heavily criticized in some quarters, including by some very senior former uh, uh, diplomats uh, for her speech. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I believe that Marina gave one or two, like she gave one basic interview to Associated Press. Mm -hmm. Uh, <clears throat> that dealt a bit with foreign policy, uh, the region, not much of a surprise there, but I think that, uh, as I described, I think she would go into a, a different direction. Uh, ISO NAV is the same, ISO NAV is focusing on trade, uh, but the problem is, frankly, that uh, the most likely scenario is uh, that President Vilma will continue to uh, have, uh, you know, will continue to be at the Palacio do Planalto. Uh, we all know that uh, President Dilma is not particularly uh, interested uh, in the subject of diplomacy. She doesn't have a temperament for diplomacy. Uh, and this is, I'm not saying that, I'm going to read to you something that mm -hmm. uh, junior diplomats, and apparently 340 of them, we have 1,400 diplomats. So a good proportion of Brazilian diplomats uh, sent recently a letter, according to Folha de São Paulo, and this has not been denied by anybody, 
uh, saying that uh, the government of Brazil, of, of Dilma, deconstructed uh, everything that the, the administration of Lula and Celso Amorim, the former foreign minister, uh, did for Itamaraty and political, uh, foreign policy. Those are diplomats talking. People that are hired uh, have their, are there working to promote diplomacy. Uh, and so I will not argue with them on that. Uh, they have that position. I talk a lot with diplomats. And you can sense an enormous uh, frustration, a disappointment, uh, to the point that sometimes you have to contain people uh, to be calm and not say things that they could harm themselves if said in the wrong places. I have many friends that are diplomats, many. Actually, I think, uh, well, it's a, one of the few advantages of age. Uh, all the, I know a lot of former Brazilian ambassadors now that remain friends and uh, remain active. And uh, I, I disagree with their thesis. I think they are under an illusion that under President Lula and Amorim, we had this very active foreign policy. We had a kind of a celebrity uh, foreign policy. We wanted to be, because of President Lula, which is such a magnificent, has a, such a wonderful history, I think uh, his election was very affirming of Brazilian democracy. His personal biography allowed us to, and the success at home of poverty reduction gave a lot of legitimacy to an agenda that would put Brazil in a position here. We, we, we are not preaching to you. We are doing it. We want, we want to do diplomacy by example. So for a while, there was really a vision. Uh, but that vision did not materialize. Uh, that vision produced one thing, which was the increase of the staff of Itamaraty from 1,000 to 1,400. Because there was an idea that that vision would correspond to actions here and there. There would be initiatives, etc. Give me one example. In 2005, there were 12 diplomats at the Brazilian embassy in Washington, D.C. In 2009, there were 28. So one would assume that uh, you know, this would correspond to an expansion and a deepening of the relationship. Actually, it ended up corresponding to the creation of, I think, I, lost, I stopped at 22 working groups. And that when then later was created the working groups of the working groups. I stopped there. Uh, because uh, frankly, uh, 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 I do not agree that there was, it was none of the strategic objectives stated by uh, President uh, uh, Lula with probably the best of intentions were achieved. Uh, uh, the integration in South America, there were some successes in terms of and some positive interventions in terms of UNASUL, especially in diffusing a couple of crises. Uh, but uh, the vision was not because uh, you ended up actually complicating things. Uh, Brazil ended up complicating things when it incorporated uh, uh, Venezuela to Mercosur in a way that according to a former foreign minister and I cite, Celso Laffer, who wrote at Fora de São Paulo, that was done illegally. That was done uh, in, uh, 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 was not, did not respect the terms of the treaty. And uh, I remember have receiving calls from dear friends, Brazilian diplomats, saying, we don't do that. We follow treaties. We follow agreements. Uh, so this is the, you know, uh, 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 and the other two things were obviously we wanted to uh, the the idea of uh, a reform of the national the Security Council of the United Nations with Brazil. This is a very old demand for Brazil, once supported by President Roosevelt, mm -hmm. uh, that Brazil becomes a permanent member if one day the Security Council become uh, is reformed. Uh, well, again, if one day it is reformed, I don't mm -hmm. see it being reformed in the next maybe, what, 10, 20 years. Uh, I don't think that Brazil will get uh, much support in order to, from the countries that would normally support Brazil, the democracies. Uh, I don't see it happening. And the third one that was, would have been the coronation of a foreign policy strategy based on trade, the trade expansion, trade liberalization, which was first you work South America, you organize that space, and 
in a open regionalism, and then you bring that to the WTO. At the WTO, we do the liberalization where every subject is discussed, which was, I think, a reasonable way of thinking. Problem is, didn't work. The WTO, as you know, the Uruguay round, the, the, the Doha round has collapsed. It's not going to be revived. So if you judge things by uh, measuring the results of what was intended, uh, it's pretty frustrating. I don't see uh, much uh, uh, changing. Obviously, uh, if uh, 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 President uh, Dilma Rousseff gets re-elected, I assume she will make efforts uh, to try to get some traction. Brazil needs to, in order to revive its economy, Brazil needs to open its economy. Mm -hmm. In order to become more competitive, Brazil needs to open its economy. This in itself would be a fundamental change in Brazilian foreign policy. And uh, uh, I am always hopeful. I think that uh, uh, the pressures that were in the streets uh, in uh, June of 2013 uh, uh, will come back, will resurface if their demands that were heard then are not uh, 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 don't get a response. And uh, uh, to do that, I think you have, Brazil has to integrate itself in the world economy and in the global politics in a different way. Finally, one point regarding the late spe the speech that President Dilma uh, uh, made at the UN the other day generated a lot of controversy because she, uh, Brazil didn't do a combination of the the, the horrible uh, uh, terrorist acts uh, of people decapitating people in front of the television. There was not a, initially a mention of that, but there was a denunciation and a criticism of the, uh, which was, you know, the traditional Brazilian posi position. You know, uh, things are better solved uh, through dialogue, etc. Then there was an explanation by the foreign minister saying, no, no, she was not. Re President was not referring, obviously, to dialoguing with the guys who, with the, 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 the executioners, right? Uh, one very senior former diplomat in Brazil uh, thought that it was. Actually, he wrote a piece, I'm referring to Rubens Recupero, uh, a man known, was ambassador here, said that dialoguing with the executioner. It, this was the title of his column the other day. Uh, and, but then the foreign minister they came out and said, no, the dialogue was not that, you're misunderstanding. It's the dialogue with the international community about this issue. Of, uh, yes, there is a dialogue in the international community. <coughs> the only problem is that Brazil is not part of it. Claudia. Well, oh, your reaction. I, I thank mean, you is it, for let your me just <coughs> be following this a little bit. No, no. Um, so do you think that there would be a difference depending on who wins, one? And, and two, um, how do you make out it? Because this has been an issue that has been coming up more and more, the, the speech of President Dilma at the UN and uh, the effectiveness of it, uh, the purpose of it, the reaction. Um, how do you see these things? You know, will we see a difference based on what the outcome of the election would be? Um, and where, I guess, what's the status of, of, of foreign policy with Brazil right now? Yeah, well, regarding to the elections itself, yeah. I think there is being a very volatile election. Uh, if you look at uh, 20 days ago, there was a great expectation that Marina would go to the second round with Dilma and that she could win the election. I think the Dilma campaign was very, <laughs> Uh, successful in deconstructing the Marina image. Marina had an image of a very authentic politician, someone that was out of the traditional space and with methods not always uh, uh, that not everybody think it is ethical. They managed to associate Marina with the most conservative sectors of the Brazilian society. Like the Dilma campaign managed to associate Marina with the bankers, managed to present the proposal of Marina for the independence, independence of the central bank 
as something that would benefit the rich and uh, threaten the social conquest conquer that the poor people had on the last 12 years. And also in social issues. Uh, Marina was associated with very conservative positions, especially in the question of gay rights, to the point that Mark Ruffalo, the American <laughs> actor, he recorded a video supporting Marina because he worked with Fernando Meirelles, which is a cineast, that, uh, a director that worked with him. And he received a lot of criticism on the social media. People saying that Marina was against gay rights. And then he withdrew his support to Marina. And I think Marina was not able, uh, like she, she was not very able to contest it. And she committed errors herself, like uh, releasing her program and then reviewing it in less than 24 hours exactly on this issue of gay rights. And it gave the impression that she was bowing to the pressure of the evangelical community. So she, I think she arrives in the second, uh, in the, like on the eve of the first turn in a very, in a very fragile situation. Like she's losing uh, support while Dima is increasing support in a situation which is puzzled, like uh, in which the economy is barely growing, like the, the, the economy will grow less than 1% this year, probably 0 0.5. But there is one thing, unemployment is still historically low. The unemployment in, July, in August was 5%, which was the lowest for uh, an August in 13 years or yes, 16 years. Begun. Yes. So, and you have also something that Dilma was very, uh, did in a very, that her campaign was very uh, effective in presenting the social benefits as uh, one of the main conquerors of Brazilian population. And if any of the other candidates win, they the, these social benefits could be at risk. Mm -hmm. And regarding to foreign policy, I think, uh, first of all, I think the, the relations with the United States, I think no matter who wins, even if Dilma wins, I think the question of rebuild the relations with the United States will be one of the priorities. Mm -hmm. And I think, and to use an expression of one very good diplomat and very well connected, uh, that the current situation is unsustainable. <coughs> like Brazil and the United States have a lot of uh, economic relations, trade relations that cannot, uh, you cannot have a, a high level relationship that does not match mm -hmm. this relation. The United States is the largest foreign investor in Brazil by far. Uh, Brazil is increasing its investment in the United States. There are a lot of big companies in Brazil that are increasing its investments here. Uh, the United States is the main destination of Brazilian tourists. It's the main destination of the students that the government is sending abroad mm -hmm. to study the science without borders. So I think there will, uh, and I think one expression that you use at the, in, in the report, mm -hmm. that somehow the United States need to throw a letter yeah. for Dilma to get out of the hole that she put herself. Mm -hmm. and, and I think like yesterday, Marina gave an interview to Cristiana Mampur. Mm -hmm. And I think the letter needs to be thrown to Marina as well, because <laughs> on the interview, she criticized, she mentioned the question of the NSA, and she was very strong. And she said the United States needs to recognize its mistakes. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think there, there need to be, I think with ISO in the, in the unlikely mm -hmm. 
uh, the scenario that Aisha wins, I think it would be much easier mm -hmm. to rebuild this relationship, as I was talking with Hussein before, like mm -hmm. he does not have, he was not a target of the NSA, he does not have this personal uh, difficulties yeah. that Dilma has. Yeah. Yeah. And I think another area that <coughs> there will be a change no matter who wins, I think is Mercosul. I think mm -hmm. even if Dilma wins, I think the current situation is also unsustainable. I think there is a growing sense in Brazil that the Mercosul is becoming a more uh, of a problem than, than a solution. Mm -hmm. And also, one thing that it probably would be, would see the largest or the biggest change, I think, would be the question of Venezuela. Mm -hmm. I think there will, uh, for sure, if Aécio wins or Marina wins, I think there will be some kind of uh, a more pra a less ideological relation with Venezuela. Mm -hmm. And I think what I, I and I, th I think if Dilma wins, probably things will not change. And one thing that I'm hearing, uh, there was a lot of reference, the, the principles that guide the, the Brazilian relations and the re refer reference to democracy. Mm -hmm. And it's on the charter of the OAS. And I'm hearing more and more from Brazilian officials a uh, reinterpretation of the meaning of democracy. Mm -hmm. And the expression that, oh, we need to contemplate different kinds of democracy. And Venezuela has his own kind of democracy, has his popular kind of democracy. And it needs to be respected by the OAS charter. I think with Marina and Aeso, I think there will be a, a lower degree of tolerance mm -hmm. to human rights abuses and suppression of dissent inside mm -hmm. Venezuela. Okay. But I, I think also there is, but, but there, the space to do, uh, like I don't see a rupture or uh, because we have economic relations, important economic relations with Venezuela. Last year, Venezuela was number seven in in the ranking of the main destination of Brazilian mm -hmm. exports. And we mainly export industrial products to Venezuela. And, and the same with Argentina, it's our third main trading partner. So I think I agree with the paper, like there, we, we're not going to see dramatic ruptures or changes, but I think in the question of Venezuela probably would be where, or the Bolivarian, mm -hmm. where okay. would it be more? Sergio, um, the issue that's come up with both Paolo and, and Claudia has been the, the issue of the economy. And the economy of Brazil right now faces some serious challenges. And I think Paolo talked about the economy as being the driver of a lot of the foreign policy. Who do you think would be more likely to make uh, reforms that are uh, consistent with strengthening uh, Brazilians foreign policy if it's rooted as Paolo said in uh, having a strong economy first uh, thank you for the invitation sure. well, I think Marina or I asked you they try to uh, push an agenda of reforms mm -hmm. that, that is clear uh, Dilma is saying at her programs uh, at her speeches that there's nothing uh, fundamentally wrong with their poli with their policies so I think uh, I asked Marina would pursue an agenda of reforms. But there's something that Paulo mentioned, and the situation of the economy yeah. is very delicate now. The commodity boom is over, so maybe there will be a push uh, in the direction of pragmatism, or whoever will be the next president. There's something interesting that I think that the private sector now wants free trade agreement with the US. This uh, was a major change. Brazilian industrial leaders, they are usually very protectionists. And I talked to one of the directors of Confederação Nacional da Indústria in the Industry National Confederation, and they want um, a free trade agreement to the US, a free trade agreement to the European Union, and they will press the government in this direction. I think 
in a world that uh, Brazilian economy, we won't have the uh, revenue from commodities, mm -hmm. the productivity is so low, and what people are saying that Brazil is too, um, is, does not participate in many of the supply uh, chains, mm -hmm. global supply chains, is a way from innovation. So it's mm -hmm. fundamental that you have this kind of approach to deal with free trade agreements. So, but we have, I thought, I think, any of the, can, any of the candidates, if president, they will try to uh, reset the relations with the US. It would be more difficult to Dilma, because yesterday, for example, Minister Figueiredo was here. They, they signed the, the, the end of the cotton controversy. Mm -hmm. And I was there, Claudio was there. We insisted, well, is this an, a sign of improvement of the uh, whole, of the overall uh, bilateral relations? And he was very clear that it was only a step, um, a progress in the uh, trade relations. Mm -hmm. He was very careful, he said that it's a solution for a specific problem in a specific area, which is the, the trade area. So there's some, maybe the ladder that you said in your report that they should uh, mm -hmm. give to Dilma, it's important, and something that will need to be done. But I asked you and Marina, I think they will be much more pragmatic. Even I, I didn't uh, see this interview of Marina, but uh, Mauricio Hans, one of Marina's economic advisors, he was here last week uh, at a U.S. Chamber event, and he said that uh, he wanted to, a Marina's government would develop ties with the U.S., and he said that the Mercosur is stagnated. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they, and they, would, they, are ready to, they would be ready to try to negotiate something more uh, pragmatic with the U.S., uh, Arminio Fraga, uh, a month ago, in an interview to Valor from my colleague, Sergio Leo, uh, he said that, well, about Mercosul, we should say, we'll go this way. Or the Mercosul comes with us, or we'll go without Mercosul. Mm -hmm. so it was a blunt statement. So I think mm -hmm. if ISU wins, there will be a change. In, mm -hmm. But it's unlikely that he will be even in the second round. But mm -hmm. I think Marina and... Uh, Mauricio Hans also pointed that Mercosur is stagnated, and I think they are, uh, even in Dilma's government, they are running out of patience with Argentina, for example. Mm -hmm. they, they are an obstacle for uh, negotiations in the, in the, in the, EU. With the EU, for yeah. example, and now they are delaying some payments for uh, exporters, for Brazilian exporters, because they have a shortage of dollars. So, let, me uh, stay, let me stay with you for a little bit, and I know I want to open it up, and, and there's okay. wonderful points being made everywhere, and this session should really have been an afternoon session. No? Okay. Anyway, so um, on that point, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the thinking uh, is that, so the United States is engaged in free trade agreements with the Europeans, with TPP. You're seeing a lot of activity in the region specifically with the Pacific Alliance, right, trying to be more attractive to find markets in other places. And it truly is a global sort of um, uh, reach that the Pacific Alliance is trying to have with over 30 uh, observing members from all over the world. And there's a thought that, wait, Brazil is sort of, you know, stuck out there and hasn't made any kind of alliances, not even the Pacific Alliance. This EU issue is sort of comes back more and more. What is the likelihood that this fervor or this desire, and this is for all of you, this fervor or desire to sort of break away and do something different away from Mercosur or reform Mercosur, what's the likelihood that this actually would come into being? And that's the first question. And the second issue is you talk about a lot of will or interest <coughs> in, in, in Brazil and having closer relations with the US. I worked in the Congress for many years and we were really trying to push the issue of a tax treaty for a long time and felt that that was a way of doing this. Mm -hmm. I mean, how likely is the Mercosur reform or change or movement away from it uh, a possibility? And how likely is that something like a tax treaty would be um, uh, more 
are possible during uh, on the Brazilian side, because the U.S. is a completely different discussion with the two years that we're going to have of presidential politicking, et cetera. But from the Brazilian side, how do you see that evolving? I mean, how real is this uh, interest in doing something different from Mercosur, and how real is this interest in doing something with the United States? I think any candidates would do would, would like a, a tax treatment with the U.S. It doesn't matter if it's Dilma Aécio or Marine, I think this is not a problem. <clears throat> and people, I think they will detach from Mercosur and they'll, they'll try to develop something, some strategies to do that. For example, in the EU, with the, uh, with the negotiations with EU, they talked about, they talked about the uh, two-speed integration, then the, mm -hmm. the tariffs would be lowered mm -hmm. in different uh, velocities depending on the country. I think there will be um, people desire to do something different. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, I, I'd like to say a few <laughs> things about this. You know, when I saw uh, uh, the, the, the idea uh, that Claudia mentioned, that a sort of improvement of the improving improvement in U.S.-Brazil relations is inevitable, I actually wrote that a couple of times, mm -hmm. and it, it probably it was published, and uh, it was proved <coughs> wrong. So I'm not saying that anymore. I, I also <laughs> believe that, but I'm not writing it anymore. <laughs> if you go to the Huffington Post, there is a piece of mine two years ago. It is in, inevitable, obviously. Rationally, it has to happen. And actually, the relationship between Brazil and the United States continues to be very intense, except at the level of the two go federal governments. All the other relationships are quite intense, are good. Like the, the, the fact that they finally removed this, this thing, the, 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 the cotton, cotton case, after 12 years, obviously is positive. You know, we have uh, here and there competent negotiators, and they compromise. Wow, what, a, what a, an idea. And to resolve this thing, because it's needed, it's necessary. The problem uh, is, and if you see, for instance, I, I am involved in something called a scientific cooperation between Brazil and the United States. For instance, you are all invited, October 28th, a one-day symposium at the Wilson Center about something that's fundamental to the Brazilian economy, to the future, to climate change. It's a study done cooperatively by American scientists, Brazilian scientists, ongoing uh, on the hydrological equilibrium of the Amazon region. If that goes, the Brazilian agriculture goes with it. Uh, energy production in Brazil, mostly hydro, goes with it. It's a matter, it's a very important matter. Brazilian and American scientists and with the Sao Paulo Science Federation and the Department of Energy have been working, this is a subject that has been studied for 10 years, and they are. They were in four places in the Amazon taking measurements about the size of a raindrop at different altitudes. This cooperation exists. The cooperation between industries, especially the ones that are global, exists all the time. The transit of people, you see, the only problem is the two governments cannot, they have to catch up with reality. No, the reality is much better than the relationship would. And, and this is. Uh, uh, this business of, uh, of for instance, the tax, uh, I frankly, uh, if Dilma, uh, uh, imagine a re-elected Dilma, uh, I don't know what is the conclusion she will take from the re-election. She may decide that everything she was doing was absolutely right and therefore she will continue to do the same thing. She may also, she has all the power and she's a very energetic person. Uh, and say, so let's do a tax treatment treaty with the United States. A tax treaty with the United, Brazil and the United States uh, would probably be worth two alcas for Brazil because it would make businesses th this, that already exist between you know, some American companies have been in Brazil forever and there are some major Brazilian companies here mm -hmm. now. If you facilitate that, that would create its own momentum for a tax treaty. I have no, there is a matter of political will and conviction. And if a president, a re-elected president Dilma or an elected, they have to put together their people, negotiate and move. That, that's, it's very simple. You have to have the will and the capacity to do this. I would like to see that. Uh, and, uh, you know, on the NSA thing again, uh, you know, it's, uh, there are certain, 
It's Milor Fernandes, a great satirist, that once said that when ideas get old, they move to Brazil, you know. And once we get stuff, and this is the NSA, and now we're not going to get away with the NSA stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, the Indians, India, was the main target of the NSA spy. No country, no prime minister, no, it was more spied on by the NSA, this operation, than India. Uh, the, the prime minister of India, the Modi, who was actually, had a visa, it was, he, what, canceled, right? At some point. I don't know. No, yes. he could not, he know. was on the list of people that Yeah, no, no, not I think he visa. was denied. The visa was revoked and then was reinstated. So it was much more serious situation. He was here the other day at the White House because pragmatism, because the interest, the national interests of India are informing a policy in this world and India participates in very complicated negotiations regarding uh, international peace. And so this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think it's very difficult to talk about those issues right now because we have to see what is the outcome of the elect. Like maybe if we have a second round, maybe the candidates will use the second round to debate some of those questions related, for instance, to the economy that are related to foreign policy, but they have not so far, so we don't know what they really think. And I think uh, also the question of NSA and, yep. like, I don't think during the election moment, during the campaign, like, I don't think Dilma can uh, in any way mm -hmm. uh, reach a position that if she would appear uh, not being tough with the U.S. But even though when she, she gave an interview to Christian Amon for last month, in which she said, that, well, the problem of NSA is not a problem of Obama. It was something that was a consequence of the war on terror. That seemed to be a kind of opening for a, a less uh, uh, confrontational mm -hmm, mm -hmm. position. Mm -hmm. Let me allow me to make some uh, brief remarks. Uh, one on the Brazil-U.S. relations. Um, I think Dilma she threw the ball in the court of the United States, and uh, she need some important and strategic signs from Obama's administration. No matter whom gonna win, I don't think even ISU or Marina they will be capable to improve the relation without any important sign from the United States. This is a very crucial point. Mm -hmm. uh, what Brazil want, and no matter whom will be the president, it's a recognition on the Brazilian condition as a strategic partner of the United States. And ultimately what we should ask, what do the United States want from Brazil? They want a partner, they want a strategic partner, or they want to maintain Brazil in the ghettos of the American foreign policy. Uh, so those are very crucial questions. I don't believe ISU will restart the relation just because he wanted to do without any counter offer from the United States. Uh, uh, you know, when uh, people talk about that in this country, uh, strategic partnership for the United States means something very different than what mm -hmm. it does for Brazil. Mm -hmm. So when we put that on the sheet, I think it's helpful and necessary to define the terms. So uh, institutional relationships, legally binding relationships is usually what strategic means to the US. And, it, and up until now, it's been difficult to develop that kind of relationship with Brazil. So when you talk about, when Sergio talks a little bit about a willingness mm -hmm. to embark on a different kind of policy with a tax treaty, or uh, an evolved or a different kind of version of Mercosur for obvious reasons. That kind of talk is a little more uh, sort of consistent with what the United States sees as sort of the pillars to create a strategic relationship. When people talk about the Security Council, I mean, I don't know when Security Council reform is going to happen. Maybe you're right. Maybe it's 10 years from now. I don't know. But one of the things that you hear from folks here is that Sure, we'd support Brazil, but Brazil would have to be supporting a lot of the things that we support because we don't want to put another member on the Security Council that doesn't work so much with the United States. And that's just sort of the United States response. So it's very helpful to get a sense of what strategic 
relationship means. I know because of our previous conversations that there are competing orbits now that didn't exist before, like the BRICS. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that is something that I think we sort of need to unpack. And, I, and I, I'd like to unpack a little bit of this. I'm sure there's people that have questions. So I don't want to um, sort of just monopolize. I think we will go over a little bit, but I'd like to get back to that. But first of all, let me, let me open it up and get some questions from, from the audience. There's twi tweeted questions as well, so I want to try to get everything. Victoria, if you could just go to these gentlemen over here, and we'll just take, how many questions are there? Uh, we'll take one, two, three questions, and then we'll, you guys pick which ones you want to answer. All right. If you could just identify yourself first and your question. Hello, my name is Jose Miguel Pulido. I work at Mitsui. Uh, thank you very much for great presentations. I was wondering about the issue of go governability. Uh, if Marina or Aesio or Dilma wins, uh, Dilma will probably have a weakened PT. Uh, Marina said that she doesn't want to construct alliances, which is, would be very new for Brazil. So even if they want to start economic reforms, what's the likelihood that they can accomplish them? Thank you. Okay. Next question. <laughs> I think the gentleman there. Yeah, yeah. Vittorio, right there. Um, just, um, I, I won't ask a question on this, but I just note that China wasn't discussed very much. Who, who, who identify yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Tom O'Donnell. I work in energy and international affairs. I'm currently in um, Berlin teaching. Um, uh, uh, two things. Uh, well, one, the NSA issue. It's always dealt with referred to as though, well, it's kind of silly that people go on about this uh, because it's things that happen between governments and it's political, it's, uh, it's for public consumption. And I've heard a number of American ambassadors or, and other diplomats, both in Europe and Latin America, say, more or less say things like that, and it really shouldn't be taken. I, and I think there's just a disconnect by the United States in understanding. Mm -hmm. One thing that everybody that they always say, I noticed, is that, and of course, there was no economic side to this. But Brazil is precisely a country where there may have been significant economic effects of the uh, spying. One is, uh, you know, the negotiations over the airplane sales. If, they were, if those negotiations, in fact, were being spied on, it raises the question, were the American commercial negotiators given information? Of course the other side, when you find out that, doesn't want to sign the contract, because who knows what, what they knew. Uh, it raises legal issues in the United States mm -hmm. and other competitors didn't get the information. And the same thing with Petrobras. What are the effects? So I think it's a pragmatically has to be, it's not just a matter of an apology, there has to be a certain trust involved, okay? If you could address that. Um, the other thing is with Venezuela. Uh, again here, it's often, this is often addressed as a question of, because of the political proclivities of the Workers' Party, there's a sort of closeness. But I think what's left out is that the business, there's a significant section of the business class that might not be PT, but they, they agree with uh, keeping relations uh, in this way with Venezuela because Venezuela is rather a basket case. And what it's really going to need over time is infrastructure, not only, not only exports. And Brazil, of course, uh, probably, I, I would uh, predict that more so than China, it'll be Brazil that supplies this sort of thing. And so it's, I think if you could address this, it's not just a political question, but there's, a, there's business interest. Mm -hmm. okay, great. And the gentleman in the back there, and I think then we'll let you guys pick. Vittorio? Uh, straight to the right. There you go. Hi, my name is Marcio Coimbra for the Huffington Post Brazil, Brazil Post. Uh, Brazil is going to go through the next year through very dramatic economic adjustments even with Juma or um, more with Marina or ISU. And, I, and in some economists say that Brazil may hit the bottom next year economically. So I would like to hear from you, what does this impact with the relation with the United States? Okay, great. Who would like to go first? About the governability. Well, if uh, Dilma wins, she will keep the majority in the Congress, I, I guess. No Brazilian president has such big majority in the recent democratic era in Brazil. This is very easy to talk about. Secondly, if ISU wins, well, probably the PMDB will move toward ISU, and they will uh, rebuild the association during the 90s, uh, PMDB, PSDB, and uh, PSD, and whatever. If Marina wins, then uh, I guess she will be in trouble. 
sh what we should uh, look at if she will be capable to make some concession. And what she now, during campaign, what she's saying, that well, I'm not going to do concession, I'm not going to make the old way of politics, whatever. But you cannot govern without the PMDB and the Congress. You know, so effectively will depend ultimately on one sh uh, what kind of concession that she will uh, able to make to have a majority uh, uh, to govern. Let me say something. The only certainty about Brazilian politics next year, in 1st of January, is that the PMDB will move towards whoever wins the election. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the PMDB does. That's what it But does. depends how many That's, ministers they will have. Yes, no, it's a matter of price. Okay? Uh, that's all. It's, uh, and that there are presidents like Fernando Henrique Cardoso that managed to protect certain key areas of the government where there was no negotiation uh, about governability and, and then dealt with PMDB and all the... We have 32 parties. Yeah. It's a pluralistic country, you know. <laughs> we, we deal with all those. It, it's a nightmare. It's fragmented. doesn't work. I bought a governability. Uh, there was one president in Brazil that uh, governed under very dire circumstances, a very decent man, a, a, a very valiant uh, opponent to the dictatorship, Itamar Franco, a senator from Minas Gerais that eventually became our president, had no political party, had no basis in Congress, uh, and was able to select a group of people in a difficult situation that resolved the two most negative the legacies of the military dictatorship, the foreign debt crisis, and uh, the, f the danger of uh, near hyperinflation, the hell plan. This was done by uh, a president that governed. All, all of this was done in a year and a half. So it's perfectly possible. Uh, I think that what the problem of governability that I would see is uh, once uh, there is probable a re-election of President Dilma Rousseff that the economy will not allow her to respond to the demands that were in the streets last year, remain there, which is we want more, we want better, we want faster. And all of this is, will cost money. And President Dilma will not have the space to respond to that. So my Difficult with this, the problem of governability is uh, the possibility that the, the streets could erupt again. The campaign has been, in a sense, in certain senses, it's very good. Actually, the, the, the campaign, the organization, there is a debate. But uh, because of the, uh, the, the, what the candidates chose to, send, to, to focus on, there has not been really so far a debate about the tough choices the country has to make. So therefore, it's very difficult to see. And finally, on NSA, I just think, you know, I think it's important to deal. I think Germany is one of the countries that is dealing with this seriously. Germany has an absolutely strategic relationship with the United States based on values. Uh, and uh, is able to deal with that. Uh, I, be, I hope that Brazil will, and the United States, will get an understanding. You're absolutely true. Trust is absolutely fundamental. And if countries have to do uh, clandestine work, and all, most countries do it, uh, they should at least hire professionals to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Safety, do you yeah. want to answer the question on the economy? Or? Well, um, I believe it. It, the economy will be in a very difficult situation. For uh, there will be, there's a need to be a fiscal adjustment because now we are running almost no surplus. We, we will have to adjust the managed prices like gasoline. So it will be very difficult, <coughs> and it's better if it's, it's done in the beginning. And uh, part of it's a problem of credibility. If you look at the Business confidence, consumer confidence, it's in 2009 levels that was in the middle uh, of the crisis. Mm -hmm. So if it's, uh, the expectations are well managed, uh, it's mm -hmm. possible to do that to overcome. Um, a, fi um, a finance minister with a uh, good speech, with a good uh, team mm -hmm. would do part of the job, I think. It's, then it would not be necessary to raise m much more the interest rates. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the, agenda, the economic agenda is more or less clear to everybody, but President Dilma, during uh, her campaign and her economic aids, 
they said repeatedly that there is no fundamentally prob there's no fundamental problem and they should keep the course there will be some changes that he she will change the uh, finance minister she announced it but uh, she, if she insists in this approach maybe there will be uh, some problems, especially on the credibility side. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I find it difficult to uh, relate it with your question about what it would mean to the US. Maybe uh, Brazil will be too uh, worried about its economic nice problems that the foreign policy would be in second plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think there is, a, the, no, there is one also. question that is also that will be very difficult for the economy next year is the external sector mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that will suffer the impact of the likely uh, raise of interest rates in, in the US, which is already affecting, mm -hmm. which in the long run could have an, uh, a positive impact with yeah. the devaluation of the real. Yeah. And regarding the NSA, I, I always, uh, I, I don't like this speech of that. Oh, everybody does. Mm. So it's uh, because this speech that everybody does, it's one that only benefits the ones that can do. <laughs> and <laughs> the ones that, the, the country that could do uh, the, the espionage, the scale that the US does is only the US. So I think it's not a, cannot be used as a justification. I think. The concerns of the Brazilian government, I think they are justified. And I think we should also kind of rewind. If you look at the, the, the relationship before the NSA scandal, like what we were seeing in last year, like it was a very positive scenario. Like there was this uh, engagement, the engagement was growing. There was the expectation toward the state visit, was a visit that Dilma insisted in doing. It was something important for her. So I think if we take the NSA thing from the picture, yeah. it was a positive, a positive agenda, scenario. Yeah, definitely. So yeah. I think the question now is how the two countries take the NSA out of yeah the picture and go back to where they were. And yes, but, the agreement but, but is important. That, that, and the, yeah, I think the, the agreement, agreement, the cotton agreement that was reached yesterday. It, yeah. yeah, I think it's a, 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 a signal mm -hmm. that, the two, that the things are going on, they're moving on. And, and there was, from the US side, there was uh, concessions. Yeah. Uh, I think if Dilma will be reelected, she will have less pressure also to improve this relation. Uh, and this year will be very hard for her, like uh, running campaigning and uh, accepting to dialogue with the uh, Obama administration without any uh, gesture, positive gesture, she will be easily targeted by the other candidates. So I think also she's waiting for the second term to try uh, to build a strategy for that. But also she, what she also, uh, what also that require is uh, the, I coordinate strategy to rebuild the confidence, the level of the confidence mm -hmm. between both countries. This is very important. And what she is expecting, it's uh, any minimum action from Obama take her off, out of the box. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But without that, you cannot leave it. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I, just one thing, having been kind of a veteran here. Uh, Obama, President Obama will face now an election where his party may not fare very well, and that is another information mm -hmm. that will be relevant <clears throat> for the future, how much engaged he will be able to be. Uh, sometimes I find it unbelievable that Obama has now to get to worry about his own safety in the White, the White House. Frankly, you know, it's 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 pretty complicated. I I I think that yes, uh, they can make just. But what I wanted to to tell you that you know this a very unfortunate episode of the NSA, and I totally agree that President Dilma was absolutely uh, dedicated to improving those relationships. Yes. I have no doubt about it, uh, uh, and. Uh, what happened, and then after what happened, other things happened that left lots Second. of resentment mm -hmm. on both sides. And those are things that you cannot ignore. 
and that those are, will be factors, and we know, because we talk to people here, we talk to people in Brasilia, it's very, very unfortunate that the two largest democracies in this hemisphere uh, had to go through that. If there is, you know, Brazil has all, and the United States, have all the means to uh, face their problems, and we have been proving this, you know, uh, Brazil is the country, I like to say this, or I heard it somewhere, I like it because it's true. Brazil always does what you least expect. We surprise people, we have a capacity to. But, you know, it's a matter of, and not only in Brazil, it's also here. Those things depend fundamentally, the willing to engage and to resolve and to move forward, depending on vision and leadership. If there is leadership, those things happen. Take all the, 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 in the history of recent agreements, things that were absolutely impossible. Uh, leaders uh, are the people that make things uh, move forward. I think it's perfectly possible because the two societies want to get closer. Sure. That I have no doubt about it. But uh, the message apparently has not reached the governments yet. Um, this has been a very fruitful and useful session. Uh, I want to I thank you for, for agreeing to come. I want to thank you, Hussein, uh, for working on the paper. Um, I think it's a, a great uh, piece that contributes to the, to the discussion on these issues and expands and deepens understanding on this relationship. Uh, I want to finish with something positive. Um, since you said that Brazil was the country that surprises Always does what That's right. least expect. So Churchill said about the United States, and you probably know this quote, mm -hmm. that the U.S. always does the right thing after it's tried everything else. <laughs> we, 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 we do the same. I think sure. that's what's going to end up happening. I think we're going to have a couple of challenging years. Obviously, we have a presidential election, and, and we call it the silly season here in the U.S., and you never know what's going to happen. But uh, um, that, That's just the reality of our democracy. But I think that eventually... Uh, the two rivers will come together, will be going in the same direction because, you know, it's in our benefit. It's in both of our countries' benefit to do this. Um, so anything that we can do to uh, expedite that process, and I think these events actually do help that because they maximize understanding, uh, is something that, that, uh, that you will always find me uh, game to doing. So thank you, Paolo. Thank you. Uh, Claudia, Sergio, and Hussein, thank you everybody for coming.